Okay, well, hi everyone. I have uh, a special guest to introduce, um, Professor Eli Summer. I, I did say that right, right? Eli Summer? Well, that's how Americans pronounce my name, but I pronounce it Ellie. Ellie? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, Professor Ellie Summer. Correct. Um, I actually found his videos when I was looking up Maladaptive Daydreaming, and I found out to my surprise that he was actually the man who coined the phrase maladaptive daydreaming and I was all impressed really. Um, and you wrote the first paper about maladaptive daydreaming, is that right? That's correct. And later two other papers appeared, now I'm involved in extensive research and I, I hope that we'll be able to establish this as, as a uh, a disorder or a, um, a clinical phenomenon that deserves attention of the scientific and the clinical community. Well, perfect. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get to the questions that I had for you. All right. Um, so the first one uh, was when you, you first heard clients talking about their intense daydreams, did you actually wonder if it was another known diagnosis like schizophrenia? I ask because some with maladaptive daydreaming have been diagnosed as schizophrenic. Right. No, I, I think that the disorder has, oh, I mean, the maladaptive daydreaming has only superficial resemblance to schizophrenia, but is, is not, nothing like it at all. Schizophrenics are, in, are people who have a mental illness that creates changes in the brain and, and is, is genetic and it causes them uh, um, to involuntarily hear bizarre voices that they don't want to hear. Uh, they are emotionally flat usually. Uh, they, are, they have problems with initiative, uh, getting up in the morning, taking care of themselves. They have odd thinking, odd speech. Um, so this, this has really very little to do with, uh, with daydreaming. And I think the reason why some professionals might have mistaken maladaptive daydreaming for schizophrenia is because folks who, who, who fantasize intensively and vividly sometimes report that they can really see things and feel things as if they were real. And that it is so compelling that they really, it actually feels like a, se a sensory experience mm. uh, that creates feelings and, and so on, and they move. And so I think that some, some mental health professionals uh, perhaps mistook it, these kind of uh, reports as, as representing hallucinations, which they are not, because... Although maladaptive daydream can be extremely um, it, uh, sort of uh, addictive in, in its uh, attraction, um, to summarize, I think I understand why some professionals who have never heard about this kind of intensive daydreaming uh, were mistaking uh, these reports of very vivid Im imaginings, uh, uh, mistaking them and confusing them with hallucinations but it has nothing to do with schizophrenia. Okay, okay. And uh, I think my second question has basically been answered. Uh, what would you tell prof suggested professionals diagnosed in my maladaptive daydreaming to tell the difference between this and schizophrenia or other conditions? Uh, did you have something to add or is that pretty much answered? Well, um, <laughs> yes, uh, all, all sorts of, let me turn my phone off. Um, well, there are several disorders that um, people uh, get diagnosed for instead of maladaptive daydreaming. Uh, <clears throat> some people report that they have trouble concentrating uh, and that they are restless because of the movement element in maladaptive daydreaming. So some clinicians um, uh, see that perhaps as a manifestation of attention deficit disorder and hyperactivity, so it gets diagnosed as that. Some people emphasize in their report to their uh, clinicians that they feel compelled to daydream, and they it really it, it it's a it's a drive that they f they find find hard to control, 
And that is then interpreted as perhaps obsessive compulsive disorder and is treated as such. Um, others report uh, alongside the intense fantasizing, the others report uh, their uh, associated social problems like shyness and uh, uh, and social anxiety and so on. So they get treated for some kind of, for their anxiety disorder. And the first group of, uh, of uh, patients that I diagnosed were all survivors of uh, childhood adversity. And they, uh, they developed this capacity to get absorbed in their own minds just to get away from the pain of, of, of their childhood. So I thought... I initially thought it's, it's some sort of a dissociative disorder because it has to do with this intense absorption. It's like a state of hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And our current research, which we haven't published yet, indicates that um, uh, maladaptive daydreaming is strongly associated with absorption, with the capacity to be too completely absorbed into and focused on something uh, to the exclusion of, of others, our other stimuli. So it has some components of, of, of dissociative disorder. Uh, but as I told you, it also resembles several others mental health issues. And we're still in our first steps of trying to understand this. Kind of like with Tourette's where it has the one main thing, but then it has all of these other things around it. it. I think that there are several pathways leading to maladaptive daydreaming. Some people daydream intensively just because they can, because it's a gift, it's a talent. It that is. Not, that not, uh, Envy. Yeah, I, I don't have it, and I, 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 sometimes I wish I had. So, uh, so some people daydream a lot because it's, they tell me it's great fun. Um, others daydream because it's a nice alternative to uh, 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 the hardships of life, past or current. And still others feel like um, it's, uh, it's nice to, to imagine so vividly an idealized self and their, while their self-esteem is quite low. So there are different, different pathways leading to it, but the common denominator to all uh, different forms of maladaptive daydreaming is the ability to do it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ability. That, that is that uh, only some people have it, and people use it, uh, you know, ac according to their life circumstances. Sometimes on, just for to play a fun video in which they are superheroes uh, in their mind, and others so just to to soothe themselves. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, here we covered this a little bit. What do you feel are the main causes of when developing maladaptive daydreaming? All right, so it starts, to my mind, it starts with the capacity that uh, some people have and, and many don't. And, and then I think um, it is so rewarding, so tell me the people who daydream uh, extensively, that it has an addictive capacity. So one ca one cause would be you know the tendency to um, towards addictions, uh, and, and that's not necessarily you know you know anything good can become when when exercised excessively can become uh, addictive. You know everybody can enjoy a good glass of wine, but having a, a bottle every day uh, you know is a, is too much. Uh, and sometimes you need to drink a lot to just to get away from your troubles. So, uh, so the ability, and then we ha we talked about the um, the um, uh, addictive capacity, and and then uh, of course the third main uh, drive to do it is uh, uh, the um, ability to co to cover up and uh, and. Uh, and, and sort of control uh, emotional pain and uh, uh, distract from, from internal or external difficulties. Um, <clears throat> that could be either memories or 
intense psychological conflicts or lack of social skills. So that, that probably more than one cause that, that could lead to that. Interestingly, I just uh, came across two research papers of child neurologists, and they report of, uh, about a, uh, a st they call it stereotypic uh, movement disorder. Um, and apparently some parents identify that their children engage in, in repetitive movement. Uh, they rock or they, they pace back and forth. And they're concerned a little bit about this odd behavior. And they bring their children to, to the doctors. Then they're referred to specialists, to neurologists. And it seems that these children report that while they do this, what is called stereotypic movement disorder, they fantasize in oh. intensely. So these two papers, I think, are reporting about the same problem identified by the parents who observe their children being totally absorbed in their world and rocking and moving back and forth. And, and so this is so, sort of the observable aspect of daydreaming. A lot of people report that they pace or move or rock. So some of the parents identify that, bring this to the attention of clinicians. It's identified as a movement disorder, but the report in the literature is that this movement disorder is associated with intense imagery. So we might be talking about the same pro the same issue. Okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I might get in touch with these folks and, and see if we can collaborate on some research. Although, you know, my focus is on adults. But I've interviewed one child with the permission of their parents. The parents that suggested that I interview the child. And they showed me some videos of that child. And it looks odd. And I know adults who do it, do it very privately because they are a little bashful about their behavior. So they hide it so nobody knows. But children, of course, they're very naive. So they do it in the, while they play. And, and it's identified by their parents. So it's probably the same thing. How common is it a person to act out their daydreams, and why do you think they do this? Well, I, I don't know why you mean by acting out. I, I, what people tell me when I, when I talk to people with maladaptive daydreaming, they tell me that they sometimes they talk out loud their conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, if they are concerned about being heard, they whisper it, but that's the extent that it's acted out. People tell me that when emotionally compelling interactions happen, they can weep or 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 laugh or be sad. Yes. Uh, so I don't know if you refer to that, but that you know that's the extent of acting acting the daydreaming out. But they they are all very aware that it might look odd to the onlooker, and they hide they hide it. So people mm -hmm. prefer to do it in their own privacy, and 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 so so that they're not like they are acting it out on the street. I know I know if that's what what you meant. Well, I in my case when I was doing it years ago uh, at work, let's say I was mopping, I would incorporate the fact that I was mopping into the daydream. Yeah. Or if I was washing, wiping down the table, I would just, or I was just walking down the street. I would incorporate walking down the street into the daydream. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. But that's not actually acting out the daydreaming. It's trying to incorporate real life into, into the fantasy, and also <clears throat> pay attention to how you, what you described. You said it's mostly associated with movement because movement is some, for some reason, very important. So mopping or walking uh, it, it activates or maintains uh, this internal absorption. And it's nice if you can incorporate it so it feels real, real, really real. Yeah. So actually, but, uh, but I think that, I mean, you, you could tell uh, if you care to on this uh, interview. Uh, most people I talk to, are, or if, in fact, all of them, are have a dual awareness because they are aware of the external reality. Yes. So if somebody would uh, 
engage with them or talk to them or stop them, they would immediately snap out of their daydream. So, and that's another dif difference between that and psychosis, because people that are psychotic and schizophrenic and they have hallucinations, they cannot snap out of it. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, no, and they would, uh, they would really believe that the external world is, uh, is, is really, and their hallucinations are out there and that they are real. Yeah. I always was able to tell the difference between fantasy and reality. Uh, question number five. When a client talks to you about their maladaptive daydreaming, are you often the first person they tell? Uh, that's because there's a lot of secrecy behind the condition, as I ask. Uh, often it is. Uh, some of the people who talk, who talk to me about it and write to me about it uh, uh, tell me that when they try to talk to their doctor about it, few have, it gets dismissed. It, it, it's not being taken seriously, it, it gets dismissed, people uh, are being told, look, it's normal, everybody daydreams, don't worry about it, or, alternatively, I mean, that, and that's the other uh, extreme reaction, it gets misdiagnosed, mm -hmm. as, as you, you started our conversation with the concern that this may get diagnosed as schizophrenia, for example. Uh, so, uh, so some have tried to, uh, but because there is little knowledge about it, it's it's misunderstood. So they don't talk about it anymore. But most are really um, uh, bashful about it, embarrassed about it. Uh, many are concerned that they are crazy. Uh, they f they feel that they are really odd, and many believe that they are the only one in the world who have this problem. You know, until they Google the right keywords, and then they come across this many, many websites such as your YouTube uh, uh, channel, who has many videos on, on related issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Really sorry about the vacuuming upstairs. I think you can hear that, right? It's not S cool. Slightly. Slightly? Yeah. Um, okay. What do you feel makes this condition maladaptive? And that it can be said that it's a normal, like, sort of condition. Mm -hmm. Well, my I suggest that uh, uh, we look at the same criteria that we apply to other disorders. To so you know anything can be uh, any trait can uh, can 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 be put on a on a um, spectrum. on a spectrum from normal to abnormal. For example, we all have sometimes sadness, and we would not call ourselves uh, pathologically depressed if we, if we are abandoned by a lover, if we fail a test, uh, if we are cons if we are if we have lost something that is important to us, um, you know. So, so these are it's normal to have occasional feelings of, of you know the blues. Uh, but if one had, if one cannot bounce out of a bad feeling uh, for days and weeks and months, then we are concerned, and when um, it it interferes with their functioning. So I would I would suggest that we apply the same criteria to maladaptive daydreaming. It is w a wonderful trait to have, and I wish I had it this capacity. So maladaptive daydreaming uh, can be regarded as pathological when it consumes too many hours of, of, you know, of waking hours, uh, when the individual um, is, is unable to uh, work properly, when it gets in the way of social life, when people prefer their imagined social life to um, the effort and the threat of engaging with real people, uh, when it interferes with concentration, and uh, creates problems in, in school work, in academic work, uh, and when it's uh, associated with distress. So when, when people are suffering from it, they, want, they, they do want to quit, but they can't, makes them feel crazy, um, uh, it, makes them, uh, it discourages them because they don't see a way out of it. So all of these factors can um, uh, you know, justify the, uh, 
um, classification of daydreaming as a problem, as maladaptive. Uh, alternatively, when people uh, can do it upon will, they are in complete control of it, can go days without it, but sometimes like to uh, have a good um, fantasy for two or three hours. I mean, that's like having a video on demand in between your ears. Uh, and it's better than video because it feels real. A video is just two-dimensional. This is like a, a virtual reality. Uh, um, so it can be a nice, wonderful trait to have, but when used excessively and feels like an addiction, and when it has a life of its own, then many people uh, feel distress. And indeed, people are online are, are asking for help. And we don't we don't know yet exactly what is the best way uh, to help. And I know this uh, was probably your your final question, wasn't it? Yeah. The best way to help. Uh, what do you recommend as treatment for those who want help for their daydreams? Well, again, um, th this is not based on any research yet. So uh, the the best, the most accurate, the most responsible answer would be we don't know. Okay. But. but um, but if you ask me to to guess and to sort of where would I start, because I do work with some people who have maladaptive daydreaming, I would say that it is very important to understand uh, the underlying causes and, and if there are any. Because in any indicated earlier, that could be early childhood trauma. That could be uh, a propensity to, um, to, to get addicted. Uh, as a distraction from 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 life and from problem the problems of life. Uh, if it is a compensation for inadequate social skills, so you know these need to be identified. If they exist, they need to be treated first to give people the skills they need to cope with uh, the challenges in their life. And on top of that, I think people need to learn ways to um, anchor themselves in the here and now uh, to uh, uh, by mindfulness techniques by all, all techniques that that are uh, sort of adopting behaviors that are incompatible with daydreaming uh, and so that's very behavioral for example call somebody uh, if you need to if if, if Engaging in conversation with another person helps you stop it and call a friend or talk to somebody. Um, uh, take a, take a, take a shower, go out jogging. If movement is if this kind of movement is not a trigger, um, do something that requires your attention resources rather than something that is automatic. Sometimes people, when they do a boring chore like mopping or doing the dishes. They will drift away because it's automatic. They don't. It doesn't really require any attention resources. So do something that requires your attention. So you need to be very careful. Um, well, these are these are some ideas, and also avoid the triggers. If you know that certain kind of music will throw you off, and you really want to be in control of your daydreaming, then you would want to control that. You know the cue, the trigger. That, that set, sets you off. So these are some initial ideas. Uh, the latter group of suggestions are very behavioral, but often we would have to go, as I said, deeper to the deeper causes. Uh, so, so, so I see in my mind some sort of a, uh, a package deal of these two type of treatments. And of course, we have some evidence, very preliminary evidence, and there's been one case study published on this, that some people who have had no completely normal childhoods and they daydream a lot, maladaptively, some of those people may respond to medica medication that is designed for obsessive compulsive disorder. So that's you know, another avenue to, to, uh, to explore. Um, but as I said, we are in an embryo embryotic sta stages Mm -hmm. of, of knowledge and research, uh, but thanks to people like yourself and others who are really committed to um, 
improve awareness about this, I, I'm, I'm confident that uh, we're moving along and we'll get this problem uh, recognized properly and uh, I've already presented it in, in, in two professional conferences and there are two papers that we are sub to, about to submit soon in good scientific papers. So the grassroots uh, efforts like you are engaging in and my efforts as a scientist, I think, will uh, we'll get this disorder on the map. We'll put it on the map. Right. And good, because people need to know that this exists because they feel so like, oh, no one else does this, I'm sure. So it's kind of a great thing to have out there. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for, for talking with me, for with us. Um, you guys can see Professor Ellie Summers' channel. Uh, I'm going to put it in the description, and I've also plan I also plan on putting it at the beginning of the video in the video. So uh, if you didn't click then, then you can click in the description to see uh, what he has to offer. And about about half of them, not even half, are uh, are in English, right? Right, right. Uh, and I, I'm not I'm not. Uh... I don't have too many, many videos, but, but uh, about three or four are about maladaptive daydreaming. And when I have more to say about it, I will. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. You're most welcome.